Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of r slash tales from tech support. In today's episode, customer repeatedly ignores post fail warning, damages his computer, doesn't trust the brand of drive, then asks for a discount on rock bottom pricing. Just trying to get some work done. How much stuff will we break? Before we get started, make sure to subscribe so you will never miss a video. So let's get started. Customer repeatedly ignores post fail warning, damages his computer, doesn't trust the brand of drive, then asks for a discount on rock bottom pricing. I provide on demand all inclusive IT and tech support for a few local companies. This ranges from network support and troubleshooting, basic back end web dev. I outsource most appliance troubleshooting and repair, computer slash motherboard repair, basically all inclusive. I was an e designing and manufacturing prototype PCBs before moving to computers. I also repair motherboards and phone boards, hard drives and flash drives, appliances, car electronics, radios, etc. for individuals who happen to find me on Google. I work from my house. I got a call from a customer who complained that his 16 month old HP Envy kept blue screening over and over and had a fan error and ran very slow. Me, so, when you power on the computer, you get a fan error. Customer, yes, it says fan error. The system has detected that the fan is not functional. Operating the computer can cause potential damage to your computer. Are you sure you want to continue? And then it says press F1 to continue. Me, oh, so that's an easy fix. Fans for that computer are about $20, and I charge another $35 on top of it for the install. Bring it by and first I will make sure that that is actually the issue, and then I will order it tonight. Customer, oh, I really needed to use it. It has another problem, it keeps blue screening over and over, and if it blue screens and I reboot, it instantly blue screens again. Want me to show you the error? Me, no. You should not be powering on your computer, you can actually break it that way. The warning is telling you that the cooling fan isn't working because if it overheats it will break, and nobody will be able to fix it. Note, I worded it this way to simplify it so he would understand. Customer, but it was working before. Me, I will check to see if it has been damaged by overheating. Next time, don't ignore messages like that. Customer, while well, I was doing that for a few weeks and it was working fine before, but now it won't even boot up. It just says it's booting forever and never finishes. Me, well, first, I will have to fix the fan in order to properly diagnose it after. That will be $55 for the fan, and let's see what else it needs from there. What was happening is that after 5 minutes of thermal throttling, it would eventually crash and reboot. Without giving time to cool off, he would try and use it again immediately, rinse and repeat. But we're just getting to the fun part. After the fan arrived, and I repasted it, installed the fan, and tightened some very loose hinges, booted, windows would not load from the drive properly. Most of you know what this means. The windows install may be corrupt, or the drive is damaged so. I pull all the files off the NVMe drive using an enclosure bridge, and it takes forever. I mean, 1 kbps and 100% active time. Check the drive, and it had tons of CRC errors, at least 70 counts of overtemp threshold, and it had thousands of reallocated sectors. AKA, the drive was F asterisk king fried to death. It took me 40 hours to even image the drive, and another 10 hours of test disk operation to then extract his files from the drive, most of them anyway, along with a partial directory tree. Me, hello, I figured out why Windows did not boot even though it booted before. Your SSD is damaged due to severe overheating. You can replace them for about $75, and then I would charge another $35 to install it and install Windows and copy your user files back. I have a drive here in stock, it's an SK Hynix Gold P31, it performs roughly the same as the Intel H10 that is in your computer, but is much cheaper and not prone to overheating like the Intel one. 
I also have an Adata drive which I could use, and would only cost $30, and it's lightly used. Customer, used? Can you just get another Intel one? I want to get a good quality drive. Mine was an SSD, can you make sure it's an SSD? Me, the SK Hynix is a well-known brand, the performance is about as good, and the reliability is better in most tests. Any NVMe compatible drive is going to be an SSD, they do not make NVMe hard drives, they're not small enough. Customer, I have not heard of SK Hynix, are you sure they're good? What is the warranty? Me, they make the SSDs found in many smartphones, and they supply SSDs to Acer, HP, Lenovo, and other companies. You probably never heard of them because they do not sell in stores, but mostly to other companies in bulk. I have one in my own laptop too, for what it's worth. This Intel H10 drive that was in it is a QLC flash, so they also wear out faster than the SK Hynix TLC. QLC means that each little cell that holds data has to hold a little more data, so every time you write a file, it has to do extra wear. I know I know this is very very dumbed down, but this is about how it went because this customer wanted an answer he couldn't understand. But QLC is cheaper than TLC, except Intel. The 512GB Intel drive is $140, while the SK Hynix is $75. If you would like me to order an exact replacement, I can order one now, and it will be here in 3 days, or I can charge you $75 and give you the SK Hynix now, as that's what I keep stocked. Customer, oh that's expensive. Can you not get it cheaper? Me, I know, Intel drives are overpriced in my opinion, and not very good quality. But it's your decision, if you want to. If I put another Intel drive in it, I will probably remove the metal cover over the drive, because it traps the heat in, and does not let the fan recirculate the air in there. Customer, okay bro fine, I trust you, but if it breaks I will blame you. I don't like customers like this, who blame you for everything that happens after, but it's part of the job. Me, don't worry. They have a 5 year warranty, the same as most drives like this. Alrighty, so the total here is going to be $75 for the drive, $21 for the fan, $35 for the fan replacement, and $35 for the hard drive replacement and Windows installation and file transfer. That makes your total $166 for everything. It will be ready tonight in a few hours, or you can pick it up tomorrow. Customer, oh come on man the computer is only a year old, can't you give me a break? I came to you without any referral or anything. Me, I'm sorry. My prices are as low as they can be, and I already didn't charge you for data recovery, as I hadn't even mentioned the possibility, so I already gave you a discount. Any other shop would have charged at least $200 just to swap your hard drive and install Windows alone, even without the fan, so I think my prices are more than fair. Customer, okay fine bro thanks. This customer's laptop was dinged up, a huge dent in the back, warped screen, looked like it was sat on. Why do all the worst customers also abuse the shit out of their computers? Just trying to get some work done. Original posted to slash r slash short scary story slash. Surprisingly unembellished. The programmer stared blurry eyed at his screen, the code danced before his eyes, seeming to mock him. He had spent the last month on a pop-up project, finally, he was back to his main project, which needed to be complete before he could go on vacation. So his much-needed break had been delayed a month. He sent a Skype message to Sadie, one of the junior programmers, warning her that he was modifying the same code as she was, but that he would deal with the merge conflict, which promised to be extensive. She wrote back to say she couldn't run the application she had built the security software said she didn't have permission. He took off his glasses and rubbed his eyes, the IT. Department's never-ending war against their productivity had managed to get even more oppressive. He asked her if she had tried rebooting, she said she just did so. He sighed, that usually fixed problems caused by unannounced software pushes. 
Sure, it also killed productivity for 20 minutes, as the computer rebooted and the disk thrashed mightily starting up all that security software, but at least there was some hope of getting back to useful work. Not this time. He let out an anguished cry. His fellow programmers in the open office environment didn't even flinch or give him dirty looks, they knew his pain all too well. All he could tell Sadie was that it wasn't happening to him. His skin crawled as he realized he was looking at his future. She said she was going to call the help desk. Dimly, he realized that Visual Studio has locked up and couldn't be closed due to an internal operation. The close box flashed madly, like it was trying to give him a seizure. He found several CLEXE processes that couldn't be killed, not even with administrator privileges, so finally he had to reboot too. He sensed the virtual demon had moved from her computer into his. As his workstation shut down, it said preparing to configure Windows, do not turn off your computer. Yep, IT pushed something to his computer, breaking the heck out of it, but hadn't provided any sort of notice. Undoubtedly, part of their massive overreaction to the recent successful phishing attack. Unsettlingly, he noticed that, even though the computer was off, the Windows logo was still on the screen. He knew he was down for at least 20 minutes, so he opened his desk drawer to get a snack, and realized he was all out of Costco seaweed. Miraculously, he managed to get Skype running after only 10 minutes. Sadie told him that IT support was now asking her whether Microsoft Office was working for her. A few minutes later, Sadie had an update. She told him her trouble ticket was being rerouted to the security department, which meant she had to wait in line all over again. All of a sudden, the impending merge conflict seemed like the least of their worries. How much stuff will we break? We're still in the process of integrating our company with our parent company. They are orders of magnitude larger than us, such that they have a lot of automated portals and services to handle things we still handle manually. Currently we're moving all our service accounts to be managed by their access management tool, AMT. For those of you unfamiliar, we use service accounts when domain credentials are needed, but for something that really shouldn't be tied to a specific user account. Database connections, LDAP connections, any number of automated processes for software and tools we have that need domain credentials. The AMT just provides a centralized place with logging and auditing tools to make changes to accounts and groups, all of it being user self-service. Users can manage their access themselves now, supposedly. When this was first announced, a list was sent out of all the service accounts and who would be the owner of each one. The owner would be responsible for its management in the AMT. Immediately there were a ton of questions. Why is this account assigned to me? The team in charge of the project did best effort guesses. If a person shouldn't be the owner of a service account, they need to find who should be, confirm with that person, then let the team managing the project know so they can update the account before it's moved into the AMT. Why is this disabled account included at all? it shouldn't have been was all they could say. Why are there a bunch of active service accounts not listed at all? They operated under the assumption all the service accounts in our domain were following the naming convention most of them use, service underscore purpose. They also assumed all the service accounts would be the same OU and AD. We were told if we knew of some in use we could pass them along to the team, and they would get added. All of this was exacerbated because of one missing word in the meeting invites the project team sent out to discuss these changes. They sent out their two invites with the phrase you are not required to attend. Most people saw they weren't required to attend and promptly ignored both meetings. In an unrelated meeting with my boss about how poor communication in general had been recently for all the projects IT was running, I pointed out people weren't required to attend either meeting about the service account project. He confirmed the project team meant to say you are not required to attend both. Not sure why they used that phrase when it can easily be misread even if it had the missing word. The next day the project team had sent out two new meeting invites stating you will need to attend only one meeting. It was during those meetings, now that people were attending, the biggest issue was revealed. 
Parent company requires service account passwords to be changed once a year, and if the password had not been changed within the last year, once they move into the AMT they would immediately expire, most likely breaking whatever they were used for. Owners would need to change the password to their service accounts before they get moved into the AMT. Those meetings and that revelation was last week. The service accounts are being moved this Friday. There are still a lot of people asking questions about what the service accounts they are the owner of are used for. There's a lot of confusion trying to figure out where passwords will need to be updated in their systems once they are changed. This is further compounded because we also recently moved to parent company's ticketing system, including changes. Most of these password changes will affect production systems, so they need a change. The parent company change process is much more complex than ours was, and people are struggling to fill them out correctly to get them approved. There are going to be so many service accounts that get their passwords expired Friday. I'm kinda looking forward to watching the giant disaster that's coming. What makes this funny, to me at least, is that all our distribution lists and security groups were moved into the AMT last month. The same team ran that project, and they had to deal with a lot of the same questions about where they got their information from and how incomplete it all was. Their poor communication for that project is what prompted that meeting with my boss where I pointed out the meeting issues with this project.